Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I'm going to take this video today to talk about the Enlightenment. Now, to start us off with, um, I will say that when I'm talking about the Enlightenment, I'm talking about a general period of time, roughly, depends on who you ask, but roughly from the 17th century, or if we're going to include the scientific revolution, the 16th century to the end of the 18th century. And movements like this are difficult to talk about because historically they're really hard to pin down. We're not talking about a particular location or a particular person. Rather, we're talking about groups of people in different spots that are loosely connected by some common ideas that they share. And intellectual historians just call it the Enlightenment. Um, basically to help us to categorize these people uh, into one group. Um, we're talking about people from, um, and the, the Enlightenment itself tends to center around institutions of learning beginning in Europe, but it doesn't stay in Europe. It quickly spreads from Europe, but it starts in places like Paris, from Paris, it'll move to London. From London, it'll move to even places like uh, Scotland and Ireland, eventually to places like Germany, Italy, and then outside of Europe. Uh, the Enlightenment will spread across the globe, uh, thinkers in Africa, in Asia, and eventually even the Americas, the founding fathers of the United States, for example, could be considered Enlightenment thinkers. So we're dealing with a transnational intellectual movement. And this movement, I mentioned the scientific revolution before, uh, this movement is heavily indebted to the developments that took place within the natural sciences in the 16th century, specifically what happened with Isaac Newton and the publication of his Principia Mathematica. What Newton did to physics, the, the explanation, the explanatory power of Newton's theory, his ability, uh, the accuracy of his calculations, his ability to provide a mathematical framework for a heliocentric model of the universe, all of that was extraordinarily influential and the idea was that people wanted to do in their respective fields what Newton was able to do with physics. So just as Newton revolutionized physics with his theory of gravity, um, people like uh, Thomas Hobbes, for example, will try to do the same thing in political philosophy with his theory, uh, with, with social contract theory. Okay, so let me share my PowerPoint here. So again, the Enlightenment, uh, roughly, I include the scientific revolution there, 16th century to 18th, I should say 18th, not 19th. 16th century to 18th century. Now, this video is gonna be a very, very broad overview of the kind of general themes of the Enlightenment, general developments of the Enlightenment, We'll talk about some of these common ideas here now. So common themes of the Enlightenment, these seem really broad at first, but I'll explain, and hopefully this will make sense once I explain it. So uh, two common themes of the Enlightenment, rational questioning, rational questioning of uh, whatever body of knowledge you happen to be studying, whether it's the natural sciences, whether it's politics, whether it's education, religion, take your pick, government, rational questioning, and a belief in progress through dialogue. So this rational questioning, we could use the word critique here, a critique, what are they questioning? They're applying these new methods of inquiry to traditional fields like politics, religion, philosophy, but they're also questioning the traditional established authority figures in those fields. 
Um, and by that, I, I really mean the Greek philosopher Aristotle. So th there's a long history here that I don't really have time to go into. But if you can kind of think back to the conversation that we had about ancient Greek philosophy, I talked about Plato, Aristotle. Aristotelian thought, Aristotle's philosophy, his ethics, his political theory, his physics, his cosmology will dominate Western thought for well over a thousand years. And so if we divide the history of philosophy, the history of Western philosophy into chunks, we have uh, classic philosophy, ancient philosophy, and then we have this period, uh, medieval philosophy, the medieval period. Medieval philosophers, whether they're, uh, now medieval philosoph philosophers were predominantly religious, specifically Christian. You also have some Muslim philosophers and some Jewish philosophers, but most were Christian. And most medieval philosophers accepted Aristotle as the kind of gold standard of philosophy. In fact, uh, medieval philosophers like St. Thomas Aquinas will simply refer to Aristotle as the philosopher. He's that, he's that big of a deal. He's the only one, right? The philosopher. And so when the 16th century rolls around and enlightenment thinkers start to question traditions, start to question established authority, start to reject the ideas of established authority, the, one of the big people, one of the big, again, talking about philosophy, intellectual history, one of the big people that they're reacting against is Aristotle. Now, they'll also be reacting to traditional political authority and traditional religious authority, but for the time being, they're, they're reacting to Aristotle. They're critiquing Aristotle, they're challenging Aristotle, but this is not just a tearing down of old ideas. It's also a building up of new ideas. And this is where the, the belief in progress through dialogue, these enlightenment thinkers firmly believed that the new ideas that they're creating could form the bedrock of a new age, of a new society, of an enlightened society, right? Now, the, the motto of the Enlightenment, the spirit of the Enlightenment, here the, the 19th century German philosopher Immanuel Kant would say in an essay that he published called What is the Enlightenment? He would say that the spirit of the Enlightenment can be summed up in the motto, dare to know, have the courage to think for yourself. That these thinkers pushed the boundaries of established thought, courageously exploring new territory, coming up with new ideas, and that they weren't afraid to question traditional authorities. Now, as I said before, enlightenment thought applies across the board in basically every discipline you can think of. But for the purposes of this video, we're going to focus on two big areas, and you can refer back to the intro to philosophy video if these terms don't quite make sense, but we're going to talk about the advancements and development in epistemology, and then what happened in political theory or political philosophy. Again, there's, there's other areas that the, the, the Enlightenment affects everything, but we're going to focus on these two, epistemology, and political philosophy. So the questions that come from, that arise in epistemology, again, epistemology being the, the study of knowledge, how do we know what we know? This is a reaction, again, to the developments that took place during the scientific revolution, beginning with Nicholas Copernicus's publication on the revolution of the heavenly spheres, from Copernicus, of course, we have Galileo. Galileo uh, wrote a lot about the laws of motion. Johannes Kepler, after Galileo, developing the laws of planetary motion, all of this kind of culminating with the writing 
of Isaac Newton. And this really interested philosophers because the type of knowledge that was being established by people like Newton was radically transformative and radically new. And they were trying to figure out, okay, like what is this knowledge based on, right? And how do we know that what Newton is saying in these mathematical models that he's applying to reality, how do we know uh, that this is accurate or that it's quote unquote true? So the development of new sciences like astronomy led naturally to some questions of epistemology. If we're gonna continue down the road that Newton has developed, what should the foundation of this new body of knowledge be built on? What are the foundations that Newton's principles are established on? Where does this knowledge rest? Another way to ask this would be to, to ask, what is, what is the most secure form of knowledge? What is the best form of knowledge? Where should we be looking to, to base our scientific principles on? How should we best understand the universe? There are two general answers to this that arise during the enlightenment. And that is, Rationalism on the one hand, embodied here by the philosopher Rene Descartes, rationalism and empiricism on the other hand, argued for by John Locke. Now we have a third, third system, skepticism, and we'll talk about this later, but rationalism and empiricism are the two general schools of thought that emerge. Now I say general schools of thought, Different philosophers are going to argue for, for example, a rationalistic position. Um, groups of people will, but it's not that they're like connected with each other. They're not, they're not necessarily agreeing with each other on all points. This is just a label that we're grouping. This is a category that we're grouping them into, category created by historians and philosophers, if that makes sense. So let's, let's start with rationalism. Rationalism, simply put, is the belief, going back to the foundations of knowledge, is the belief that epistemology ought to be rooted in human reason. Reason is the chief source of knowledge, and human reason provides the most secure forms of knowledge. Well, what exactly does that mean, right? So let me give you some, exam some examples, some further definitions here. So in epistemology, we have two different types of knowledge, two general categories of knowledge, a priori and a posteriori. You might have heard these terms before. A priori knowledge is knowledge that is true by definition. This is what this is what we mean by saying that reason is the source of knowledge. Rationalists would say that a priori knowledge is the most secure form of knowledge. So a priori knowledge is statements that are true by definition. So for the, the example that everybody likes to use, because most of them um, were bachelors, is the definition of a bachelor. A bachelor is an unmarried man. Now, if I say, if, if I make the statement Bill is a bachelor. If you know the definition of the word bachelor, you know that Bill does not have a wife, right? You don't have to drive out to Bill's house and search through his house and look for a wife. You know that Bill's a bachelor and that by definition, that means he doesn't have a wife. That might sound very limited at first until you realize that entire disciplines like uh, mathematics, arithmetic, geometry. It's what they had back then. Eventually, uh, branches of mathematics like calculus are all a priori. Mathematics foundationally is true. One plus one equals two because the definition of one is a single unit of measurement. You put one single unit of measurement together with another single unit of measurement. Now you have two things that you're measuring. I don't I'm confusing myself there, but it's true by definition, 
So when people like Rene Descartes, Descartes most famously, when he argues that Descartes interested in, um, he, he writes a book, um, well, his most famous is uh, Meditations on First Philosophy. This is where he, he comes to the ultimate source of knowledge. We'll, we'll talk about that later. But he writes another book called Discourse on Method, in which he's asking a question about the basis of the natural sciences. Um, and Descartes will make the argument that the natural sciences ought to be inherently based on a priori reasoning, specifically that all the natural sciences should be founded upon mathematical reasoning. And that it's, be, it's that the sciences that are the most mathematical, like physics, are so strong because of their reliance upon mathematics. So when Descartes says that when, he, when he's arguing for rationalism, this is, this is why. Um, now, other rationalists, now Newton would probably agree with that, but other rationalists like Leibniz or Spinoza, Spinoza is not really interested in science. He's, he holds a rationalist position, but it's applied to fields like ethics. Spinoza believes that you can build, or he attempts to build an entire ethical system on certain axiomatic principles principles that are true by definition. So that's why we would label somebody like Spinoza a rationalist. Now, the other type of knowledge, so a priori, before the senses, before sense experience, a posteriori, after sense experience, a posteriori knowledge is things that we know that are true by, uh, by observing them. Um, or by sense experience, by smelling, tasting, or whatever. So the statement um, that the rose on my table is red, I know that statement is true because I'm looking at, you can't show it to you. I, I bought these not to brag on myself, but you know, I brought these for my wife the other day. I, I know that that statement is true because I'm looking at it. I can say that, that the rose is red because I can see it, right? A posteriori statements that are true based on observation. Now, so on the one hand, we have rationalism. Ra think rationalism, reason, rationalism, reason. On the other hand, we have empiricism. And empiricists hold that the foundation of knowledge ought to be that sense experience. That the, the, the most true types of knowledge is knowledge that can be traced back to or maybe verified by sense experience is justifiable through sense experience and this kind of has like an intuitive appeal to it right because if i were to say um you know i have a there's a dog on my couch how do you know that statement's true or what, what sort of criteria would need to be met in order for you to accept that statement as true? You would probably say, well, let me see your dog, right? Sense experience. And this is kind of the idea behind empiricism. Now, there's we have some major empiricists, uh, Bacon, Boyle, Locke, Berkeley. And they're all empiricists for different reasons. But bottom line is they would say that justifiable knowledge, justifiable belief ought to be based on sense experience. Now, with respect to skepticism, well, let me talk a little bit about Locke. So uh, John Locke is famous for a lot of reasons. We'll talk about him when we talk more about political philosophy. Um, he, he has this phrase in his essay on human understanding called La Tabula Rosa, the blank slate theory. Um, Locke will argue that all knowledge comes from sense experience, that human beings are born a blank slate, and that everything that we know, if you think hard enough about it, everything that you know to be true, you know to be true because it's been verified by your senses, right? So skepticism is not really a school of thought in the same way that rationalism or empiricism is. But I put it on this list because skepticism really takes 
takes independent form in the modern period, in modern philosophy. Now, what I mean by that is you have ancient Greek skeptics, such as the Greek skeptic Pyro, for example. But in the ancient world and in the medieval world, it wasn't really possible to be a religious skeptic because religion was so saturated and inundated into every aspect of people's lives back then. Beginning in the 17th century, you have individuals like David Hume who will, for the first time, start to question um, common, commonly held religious ideas. So Hume, for example, fav famously publishes an essay on miracles, arguing against, um, it's, it's called, it's sometimes referred to as Hume's maxim, um, that no amount of evidence can justify a, a person's belief in a miracle. Um, that We could talk about this more later. I, I think I butchered that, so <laughs> just ignore that. Hume's maxim, you can look it up, but he publishes this essay arguing against the validity of miracles um, as a form of, of argumentation, right? Arguments based upon the existence or the happening of a miracle. Um, introducing this idea of religious skepticism, Hume also publishes these dialogues um, in which he questions some of the established arguments, the, the cosmological argument for the existence of God. You have a group of French atheists in the 17th century who are questioning traditional religious concepts. And they're using this tool of skepticism as a way to ask questions and kind of poke holes in these commonly established religious ideas. Now you also have, uh, Hume is also famous for his scientific skepticism. And by that, I don't mean that Hume was like, uh, you know, questioning the validity of vaccines or anything. That's probably what we think of when we think of scientific skepticism. Scientific skepticism in the sense that Hume is questioning um, what people like Locke would say about the, the nature of scientific evidence. So Hume has a famous objection, a uh, famous problem that he raises about scientific induction and why it's not always trustworthy, but that's kind of what we mean by skepticism. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit. So we talked about epistemology to talk a little bit about political philosophy. So political philosophy, like most things, go all the way back to Aristotle. He was the first in the West to write about the nature of government. One of the primary principal questions of political philosophy, where does government derive its right to rule? Where does government get its power from? Right? Now, Historically, you have some pretty uh, ubiquitous answers to this that are found across time, location, uh, geographical region. And it, it basically boils down to, so you, you have a, a couple of options here. And I included this picture. Um, this is a, I think this was a burial mask of Sargon of Akkad. Sargon, not to get too bogged down in history here, but Sargon being the first person in history to establish an empire. And how Sargon did this, uh, Sargon uh, established the Akkadian Empire in the region of Mesopotamia. He was the first person to conquer a bunch of different cities and unite them under his singular rule. And so we asked the question, where does Sargon get his power from? The most obvious and blatant answer to that is his military power, his physical might. Why do we obey Sargon? Because if we don't, he'll kill us. It's pretty straightforward. But Sargon does something that other kings before him had not done. Sargon will marry his military might with religious authority. He'll bring the two together. So in this autobiography that we have about Sargon, um, 
he justifies his political rule, not just through the fact that he has a large army, but also through the fact that he'll say that the gods chose him to be king. And this gets into an idea that is found all over the place in the ancient world, which is referred to as the divine right of king, the divine right of kings. And I say kings because queens in the ancient world um, are very, very rare, unless we're talking about ancient Egypt. And only, even then, it's only a handful, but different topic for a different day. If you want to talk about it, I, I love ancient history. So um, kings, ancient kings would legitimate their power by backing it up with religious authority. We see, and this is called uh, the, the divine right, that a king is a king because that king has been put there by God or the gods. You see this in the Middle East with places like the Akkadian Empire, the Mesopotamian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Assyrian Empire. You see it in Africa, in ancient Egypt. You see it in China. Um, in China, it's referred to as the mandate of heaven, that whoever controls the mandate of heaven has the right to rule. The mandate of heaven is the blessing of the gods. Uh, you see it everywhere. And for most of human history, as long as there has been government, this has basically been the model. This has been the established norm. It's not really until the enlightenment that this idea starts to be questioned. And it gets questioned in a very fundamental way by this idea called social contract theory. And we'll talk more about this later. Um, I it, it begins with people, uh, it begins with Thomas Hobbes. It's taken up by John Locke. And this idea will sound familiar to you, especially if you're an American, because it's built into our constitution. Where does government derive its right to rule? It derives its right to rule from the consent of the governed. So you can think of divine right as a kind of top-down model. God puts the king in his place, right? And the king is there because God put him there. Social contract theory is a kind of a bottom-up. Why is the king there? Because we, the people, citizens, put the king there. And this was not just an abstract idea, but it played out in some very concrete ways some very major, historically major ways uh, in the three major revolutions that happened during the Enlightenment. The English Revolution, the American Revolution, and the French Revolution. So English Revolution, American Revolution, French Revolution. We won't get a whole lot into this, but I do want to show you some examples from each of these, from documents that were produced in each of these that uh, highlight this idea of social contract theory and another very closely associated idea, the idea of um, rights-based ethics, rights-based ethics. Rights-based ethics is the idea that every human being by virtue of the fact that they're human has certain inherent rights that every human has the right to certain basic things. Now, what those things are, people will disagree about, but uh, we'll, we'll see some common threads here. So this is from the uh, English Bill of Rights, which was the first of its kind that was passed after the English Revolution. And some of this should look familiar, right? Look here, the freedom of speech and debates or proceedings in parliament ought not to be impeached or questioned in any court or place out of parliament. So political conversations that are happening within the government, the people that are having those conversations can't be punished by the government. This idea of freedom of speech that you ought to be able to freely talk about governmental policies or what the king is doing without fear of harm from the government. Of course, this is taken up in the US Bill of Rights U.S. Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution, adopts this theory uh, of rights-based ethics of social contract theory. In fact, you see this in documents uh, 
um, like the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson himself can be considered an Enlightenment thinker. He borrowed heavily from John Locke. Jefferson will say in the Declaration of Independence that all men are born with certain unalienable rights, that all men are born with basic rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? And this idea is also expressed in the Bill of Rights, the idea that U.S. citizens ought to, that they have rights that ought to be protected by or shielded from government influence slash interference. So for example, freedom of religion, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, um, freedom of speech, or abridging the freedom of speech, freedom of press is something that's introduced here. Um, the right of peaceful assembly, the right of people to peacefully protest. The gov no government had ever passed anything like this. This is what makes the US Constitution a thoroughly enlightenment document. And the US government, by extension, the government that's built upon enlightenment principles. This is extended even further in the declarations of the rights of man that were passed after the French Revolution, we have a, a universal appeal to human rights here. Uh, men are born and remain free. Now, uh, this was a history class. We could talk about one of the primary political issues at the time being the issue of slavery. This was a huge debate at the time about uh, whether or not slavery should be legal. Of course, in the United States, we fought an entire war over this, the American Civil War. Um, but if you believe in rights-based ethics, like a lot of these people did, it's hard to justify slavery as an institution. You see that here, that men are born free, that freedom is our natural state, and as a result, ought to be protected by the government. So two big areas that we touched upon, epistemology, political philosophy, um, Again, that's just the tip of the iceberg. When we're talking about the Enlightenment, we're talking about dozens of people uh, in different disciplines, everything from chemistry, astronomy, physics, to things like uh, education, ethics, city organizing, all that good stuff. So we just hit the tip of the iceberg. All right. Thank you, folks. And I will see you again next time.